Hello everybody, we're just interacting with a wonderful family in this most outlandish vehicle behind us. We've moved because the wildebeest decided to turn around. Now what I'm going to ask my expert cameraman to do is pan to the side there and show you the snaking line of thousands of wildebeests now making their way away from the river. This is the next crossing along, so they're basically heading along this way. And you can see perhaps that they are all faced towards this this way, and they may sort of turn down towards us here. They may just carry on the way they're going. This river winds a thousand different ways as it cuts its way in a basically northwest to southeasterly direction across. Uh, it sort of bisects this Kenyan section of the Mara um, Serengeti ecosystem. Sorry, hang on, I'm being tapped on the bottom by Kelvin. Yes. Yes, uh, flicking is not going to help me. What can you see? Lion. Okay, there apparently are lions the other side. Thank you, Kelvin. Um, we can't see them, of course, because they're about 74 kilometers away. Graham, can you see the... Yes, it's up. Okay, look in front of the front of that land over there. The big one. Big land right The big one, and you can see a lion. Hang on a second, everyone. You got it. Okay, Graham's got it, everybody. There's a lion. That is our first live Mara lion. It seems, where's it gone? It's gone to sleep. Behind the car. Now, I don't, it's unlikely they're going to try and hunt a wildebeest at this time of the day. It's not impossible, of course, because their color is perfect for this kind of terrain. But that massive herd that we've been looking at, I don't think is going to cross the river. This, of course, I have said on the, or based this on my experience of precisely 30 hours in the Mara Serengeti ecosystem. And then the other thing we need to show you here is a massive crocodile. Hello, Bill. You say, if I wanted to cross the river, which I inescapably don't, and I was a wildebeest, where would I want to be? The front, the middle, or the back of the herd? I would un inescapably want to be at the back, at least in the middle of the herd. It is from there that safety, uh, herd safety, is its most effective. No, definitely at the middle. Um, Bill and everyone else, I think, I'm not sure what we're going to do here. We're going to sit here for a few more minutes and then we'll probably try that very first spot that we were at earlier because I don't know that there's going to be a crossing in this particular area. Uh, that crocodile over here, Graham, if you look at it, he seems to be something of a geophage. You see he's eating that rock. Yes, he seems to be eating a very large boulder of volcanic rock which doesn't say that he was about to eat a wildebeest very nice <laughs> all the way from Greece an amazing comment hello Beth you say, <laughs> you say you discovered the stream yesterday Beth this, yesterday was the best possible day to discover the stream because the first time we've managed to broadcast live from Kenya. Of course, you've met Brent and Steph down in South Africa. I'm in Kenya for now. Uh, we will do another week of these shows at the end of September. But, yeah, what a great time to join us and so good that you can join us. And especially, thank you for telling us where you're from. It's always nice to know where in the world you happen to be from. Uh, and there you are in Greece. What we're going to do now is we're going to probably show you, oh, we're not going to move, we're going to show you, my expert cameraman is just going to show you the roof rack. He's not really, actually. What he wants to show you is a giant herd of animals that most of you will never have seen before. They are called topi. And a topi is basically a sesame. And they're, I think they're absolutely astonishing. They've got these chestnut-colored legs with 
deep, almost navy blue patches on the back hind quarter, as opposed to the front hind quarter. And then there are liver chestnut color, gorgeous liver chestnut color. And there are apparently about 200,000 of these fellows knocking about these parts. They migrate a little bit with the wildebeest, but not a huge amount. And some of them stay here, and some don't. And Joey in Australia, you want to know if there are any hartebeest or if there are any yelant. Yelant we have seen quite a few of. There are quite large herds, apparently, in various parts of this area. Um, and you want to know about hartebeest. There's something called a Kirk's hartebeest, Coke's hartebeest, that is found here. We haven't seen one. They're not common, apparently. So, yes, while they are here, we certainly haven't seen one. And I have been looking, of course, because I haven't ever seen one. It is just amazing that you can sit with your binoculars or with a, with a long lens like Graham's using now, expertly, as I said earlier, and you can just see for miles and miles, you can see an unbelievable array of animals. There you're looking at the largest safari vehicle next to the Wild Earth Safari Vehicle, of course, in the world, driving through the Maasai Mara, at least the Mara Triangle. Hello, James. You want to know why it is that the crocodile would be sitting with his mouth open, other than the fact that he enjoys eating volcanic rocks. Um, there seems to be for temperature regulation quite a lot. They like to do for temperature regulation. They flap their um, the gular pouch, not it's a, it's a gular flap, in the much the same way that birds do, uh, giving a sort of a, an indication of birds' ancient history and evolutionary past. But they flap that to keep cool. Um, but that's the main reason, I think. I don't think there's any other real reason for it. It's not very warm, though, so I don't know why it is that that crocodile will be lying with his mouth open. It might just be to breathe, perhaps. I don't know. We also know, of course, that if you've ever seen it, and it is an astounding thing to see, you find egrets, cattle egrets, will go and clean out and pick the bits out of a crocodile's teeth. This is not recommended unless you have an extremely strong digestive system because, of course, the disease available in a crocodile's rotting tooth flesh is probably going to kill uh, the likes of you and I. Ooh, and there's a giraffe. Look at that. That is a Maasai giraffe, everybody. That's our first one. Now, it doesn't look totally dissimilar from the ones that you get there in South Africa, which is the southern giraffe. But if you look carefully, you can see the markings are slightly more irregular. And at this distance, I don't suppose it looks too different, but perhaps you can, you can make out how the markings are very different. Um, we had a lovely question about whether or not, or how it is, that how many animals die from drowning versus being chomped by crocodiles during the crossings. I don't know what the stats are, you know. I think you'll probably find that fewer than 1% of the animals that come across these areas and cross to and fro across the Mara River get taken by crocodiles. I would have said fewer than 1% get nailed by the crocs. I think most, very few of them will actually drown, except during those first crossings where the banks are very steep. Then I suppose it might happen. But I think you'll find that the death from these crossings is, yeah, yeah, I'm going to say less than 1%. But remember, 1% of 1.5 million, everyone, every year, if my maths is correct, um, hang on a second, is 15,000. There we are. Phew. I, I got it, Louise. Thank you very much. Well done. Erica, you want to know if there's a limit to how many vehicles there are on a sighting at any one time? Uh, Erica, it's supposed to be five, and that's for a sort of cat sighting, but for something like a crossing, you know, if there's space, then there's no real reason to limit it to five, and so then it does tend to something resembling a free-for-all. But, you know, at a crossing, because there's space and you can see, and it's not kind of, you're not going to block animals' movements, it doesn't, there's no real limit. But yeah, it's supposed to be five. So for example, at that lion sighting, it's supposed to be a five vehicle sighting. 
All right, we're going to move on. We're probably going to go back towards the first place that we saw those wildebeest crossing. We'll see if we can't see if anything's going on there. And while we do that, let's go back to our favorite kitty with Brent Leo Smythe.